They are elected by you. I am elected by you. I am constrained as they are constrained by a system that our founders put in place. The founders separated power because they knew it was the best way to protect our citizens. Keep your eye on the ball. Structure is, uh, structure is destiny. destiny. This is Necessary and Proper, the podcast of the Federal Society's Article I Initiative. All views expressed on this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of the Federal Society. Thank you, Lily. Congratulations to the new officers of the Federalist Society. Congratulations. I'm Steph Lindquist. I'm the uh, executive director of the Center for Constitutional Design. Um, so pleased to see all of you here, some of my students from constitutional law. Gr- glad that you are here. Um, a couple of, before I introduce the panel and the speakers, a couple of preliminary announcements I need to make. If any of you are here for CLE credit, um, then you need to sign a form in the back, apparently. So please be kind enough to do that if you are here for CLE credit. And then if any of you are non ASU folks here as well. Um, We need you to sign a release so that we can take your picture. Um, That's required by ASU. So if you would do that for us too, there's a a sign-up sheet in the back so that you could just sign your name and release the rights to your picture to us. So thank you um, for that. Well, we are really excited today um, to host a panel, co-host a panel with the Federalist Society about whether the legislative power can be delegated to the administrative state. What an incredibly important topic right now, especially as we see the development of the major question doctrine um, be- become more prominent in Supreme Court decision making. Uh, and we didn't, co- it wasn't that long ago that we co- covered the delegation doctrine in my class, so first year students are no doubt studying that intensively uh, in um, their constitutional law classes. So wonderfully timely panel. And we are very pleased to have three distinguished speakers with us today. Uh, The moderator first um, is uh, familiar to many of us and has been a wonderful participant in some of the center's events, and I'm sure at the Federalist Society as well. And that is uh, Arizona Supreme Court Justice Clint Bullock. So pleased to have you here. Justice Bullock. Um, In addition to that, we're thrilled to have uh, Professor Stoner, James Stoner. He is the Herman Moisey Jr. Do I have that right, Jim? I think so. Great. Um, Professor and director of the Eric Eric Vogelin Institute in the Department of Political Science at Louisiana State University. Very distinguished scholar in a number of fields and will make, I think, uh, I think he's writing a book. Are you writing a book about this now, Jim? Try. Try. Okay, great. So we're thrilled that he's here. And in addition, we're happy to welcome from the University of San Diego, Michael Rappaport, Professor Rappaport, who serves as a Hugh and Hazel Darling Professor of Law at the University of San Diego School of Law. And he directs the center as well. And his center is called a Center for the Study of Constitutional Organization. Not to be confused. Originalism. Say what? Oh, originalism. Not, be, not to be confused with the Center for Constitutional Design at ASU. So we're very thrilled that he's here as well. And the, the format, I think, is the typical Federalist Society format, if I'm not mistaken. 15-minute uh, introductory statements by each uh, panelist, and then eight-minute rebuttal. Uh, and I think we're just going to count on the panelists to keep time. And thank you so much for for being here. So I will turn the stage over to the panelists. Justice Bullock. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for being here today. Thank you uh, for to the Federalist Society for co-sponsoring this event and to the Center for Constitutional Design, which just yesterday, I have to say, published a phenomenal article on originalism. So uh, I encourage you to check out the, oh my gosh, I was wondering why I liked it so much. Um, and uh, uh, to the speakers who you will be hearing from. So uh, this is the classroom in which I taught con law last fall. And I walked in and my first uh, thought was, crap, I'm not prepared for class. Um, but um, it's uh, it's great to be back, and it's great to see so many people here, and this should be a, a riveting conversation. Um, about one or two years into the Trump administration, the New York Times uh, published an incredibly insightful article trying to draw a common denominator um, about the judges that uh, the Trump administration had appointed. And a lot of people thought that the common denominator would be abortion or religion or one of the hot button issues. 
But the Times, I think, aptly uh, concluded that the, that the real common denominator was a hostility among most of the judges who were appointed to the administrative state. And uh, the uh, nomination of, of Neil Gorsuch, I think, really proved that the, that the Times was correct about that. Uh, Gorsuch became famous on the Tenth Circuit uh, for writing a concurring opinion to his own majority opinion, uh, taking into um, uh, taking up the issue of Chevron deference, and um, we here in Arizona uh, have resolved the question uh, that is presented today: Can the legislative power be delegated with regard to our own separation of powers provision in our Constitution, which is one sentence that comprises an entire? article of our state constitution. That's how strongly our constitution's framers uh, felt about the separation of powers. And it emphatically states uh, that no branch shall ever exercise the powers of the other. Um, most recently in a decision called Roberts versus State from last year, uh, which you might be interested in, part three really analyzes this under the Arizona constitution and was the first decision to cite EPA versus, uh, versus West uh, Virginia. Additionally, statutorily, our state um, has overturned uh, the, the Chevron doc doctrine here uh, in the uh, statutory provision that I mentioned um, that says uh, basically that statutes um, that come up in the administrative context shall be interpreted and I quote, without deference to any previous determination that may have been made on the question by the agency. I hope the U.S. Supreme Court takes note uh, that they can forget about all of the difficult issues and simply look to what we've done here in Arizona um, and embrace federalism in that regard. But I, I look forward to the perspective of uh, our two, um, uh, two esteemed professors here. For the first First time in his life in alphabetical order, uh, Professor Rappaport will actually go first, um, and followed by Professor Stoner. I will keep uh, time, and uh, as the, the Chief Justice of our court does, uh, I will do so rigorously so that we can get to your questions. Looking forward to them and to your remarks. Mike, it is up. It is. You are on. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Justice Bollock. Um, I first met uh, Clint um, back, oh, during the Reagan administration when, when he and I were as young as you guys, and uh, um, believe it or not. So it's great to see him again. I want to thank the Federalist Society and the Center for Constitutional Design for inviting me to engage in this discussion with Professor Jim Stoner on the non-delegation doctrine and on the major questions doctrine. The non-delegation doctrine is an extremely important issue because the Supreme Court's failure to enforce the non-delegation doctrine has allowed for the growth of the administrative state. If significant delegations were not allowed, the structure of our government would look very different. While recently the Supreme Court um, looked like they might start to enforce the non-delegation doctrine, lately the court has seemed to move instead towards enforcing the major questions doctrine. And thus the question really is whether the major questions doctrine is a legitimate substitute for the non-delegation doctrine. Today what I'll do is I'll first describe my view of the Constitution's original meaning as to the non-delegation doctrine, and then I'll explain why I have at best mixed feelings about the major questions doctrine. Okay, so in my view, the Constitution's original meaning is best understood as incorporating a version of the non-delegation doctrine. Under that version, the Constitution imposes a, um, a strict non-delegation rule in certain areas and a lenient rule in other areas. So under the strict tier, the amount of policymaking discretion is greatly constrained or maybe even completely eliminated. <coughs> 
And under the lenient here, the amount of policymaking discretion is, is very broad, perhaps even largely unlimited. So let me start by describing how one might derive the non-delegation doctrine from the constitutional text. In my reading, the non-delegation doctrine flows from the vesting of legislative power in the Congress and executive power in the president. But the meaning of these terms was ambiguous at the time of the Constitution's enactment. Sometimes they were understood as limiting legislatures from delegating policy-making discretion to the executive. And under this view, the legislative power involved involved the exercise of policy-making discretion in enacting a law. Executive power then would not include such policy-making. Only the legislature could make policy. But at other times, they were understood to permit the legislature to delegate policy-making to the executive. And under this view, then, the executive power included the power to receive a delegation, that is, to be given policy-making discretion by a statute. So if the terms were ambiguous, how do we resolve the ambiguity? Well, one way might be simply to decide that one meeting holds uh, in all areas, across the board. One either selects a strict or a lenient delegation and then um, applies that across the board. But that's problematic, I think. There was a, an historical pattern where delegation happened in some areas, but not in others. And people at the time sometimes seemed to recognize that delegation was acceptable, acceptable in some areas and not in others. So I think the better approach is to understand legislative and executive power to have different content in different areas. The terms legislative and executive power should be understood as terms having legal meanings. And the content of those meanings would differ depending on the area where they apply. So to determine the meanings in these different areas, the starting point is to consider the historical pattern of delegation. If legislatures regularly delegated in certain areas, then it is presumptively the case that such delegations were part of the meaning of legislative and executive power. If legislatures typically did not delegate in an area, then one would presume the legislature, legislative and executive power prohibited it. But it's not just history that determines whether delegation is permitted. In determining the meaning of these ambiguous terms, one would also consider constitutional structure and purpose. So to take just one example, constitutional structure supports allowing delegations in areas where states do not have primary legislative authority, such as territories where states can't enact things, foreign and military affairs, and perhaps even foreign commerce. While delegation may conflict with the federal structure by allowing the federal government to more easily displace state laws, and therefore would be problematic in those areas, this is not a concern where the states do not possess legislative authority in an area. Well, where does this all get us? Well, based on a review of the history, structure, and purpose, I tentatively conclude that the lenient tier where delegation is allowed applies to areas such as spending programs, legislation concerning the territories, the internal organization of the government, and foreign and military affairs. By contrast, the strict tier where delegation is prohibited applies mainly to the regulation of private rights in the domestic sphere. Not only were delegations involving the regulation of private rights historically rare, but there was also a strong purpose argument for assigning them to the strict, peer, strict tier. Private rights, such as, let's say, the common law right to own property, which one of the most valued one at the time of the framing, were considered to be among the most important rights. Thus, it would make sense to ensure that regulations of such rights had the full protection of bicameralism, presentment, and the separation of powers. This two-tiered theory has various advantages, but let me mention one that's worth you know, emphasizing in particular, 
a lot of critics of the non-delegation doctrine have pointed to examples from the, the early history of the framing and even beforehand where delegation occurred. Um, but they do not have very many examples of delegation occurring in this area, in, in this area where the strict tier applies. And therefore, their arguments don't um, uh, challenge, really, the strict tier argument. Well, once we've identified the areas where the strict tier applies, the next question involves how, we, how do we distinguish the impermissible assignment of executive power and the imper sorry, the permissible assignment of executive power and the impermissible delegation of legislative power? How do you draw the line? Well, there's two basic ways of doing this. The most common one, and I, I, I think Professor Stoner is going to adopt this approach, uh, rumor has it, um, is for people to um, rely on a distinction based on dicta in an 1825 case written by Chief Justice Marshall where he drew a distinction between important subjects that the legislature must address and other matters of less interest as to which the executive can fill up the details. Under this view, this filling up of the details would, if delegated to the executive, constitute executive power. Now this means of distinguishing between permissible and impermissible delegation is a plausible take on the constitutional language, I'll, I'll grant that. And it also has the advantage of appearing to allow some examples of delegation that existed at the founding. So it, it can handle the, the counter examples that have been offered. But it does have the disadvantage of leaving the constitutional distinction vague. Um, what's an important question? after all. While people like Justice Scalia hated such vague constitutional standards, I think they should be enforced that that's what the Constitution means. The question is, is that what the Constitution means? But there's another way to draw the distinction between legislative and executive power. It's to define the legislative power as the exercise of policymaking discretion as to the content of the laws. That is, after all, what legislatures do when they pass laws. Well, what can the executive do then? The executive can interpret statutes and can make findings of fact. In neither case is it engaged in policymaking. Thus, so long as the executive is restricted to making factual findings and engaging in legal interpretation, it does not exercise policy-making discretion and therefore has not been delegated legislative power. This test of impermissible delegations has a significant advantage. Unlike the filling in the details test, this test is pretty determinate. There's a principled answer to what policy-making discretion is. There's also some historical support for this view. It's not merely a plausible take on the meaning of legislative power. It also seems to accord with James Madison's view of delegation stated in his Virginia report on the Alien Friends Act. In criticizing the act as an unconstitutional delegation, he wrote that details are essential to the nature of a law, especially one that regulated private rights. Under this test, a law that conferred discretion on the executive to promote the public interest or the general welfare would be un an unconstitutional delegation of legislative power. By contrast, a law such as the one from the OSHA statute, which requires OSHA to adopt an occupational standard quote, which most adequately assures to the extent feasible that no employee will suffer material impairment of health, that standard might be constitutional. While the standard is now interpreted to allow policymaking discretion, and therefore it's problematic, it doesn't have to be so interpreted. For example, if the language to the extent feasible was interpreted to have a definite meaning, such as technological feasibility and business feasibility, 
and OSHA was required to make factual findings as to that feasibility, there would be no delegation of policymaking discretion. Well, while it seemed for a while that the court would apply a strict and non-delegation doctrine test, the court has moved instead towards the major questions doctrine. Doc, that doctrine states that where an agency takes an action involving significant economic or political matters, it needs a clear statement authorizing it. So it's a sort of statutory interpretation doctrine. Now, it seems that the court has embraced the major question doctrine because it does not want to apply a strict non-delegation doctrine. Such a strict doctrine would require the court to strike down a large number of regulatory statutes. It's understandable whether or not it's justifiable that the justices do not want to do that. But there are alternative ways to restore the non-delegation doctrine without striking down a large number of statutes. Unfortunately, the court has not really developed those, but I'd be happy to talk about those in response to questions. As for the major questions doctrine, I have mixed feelings about it. On the one hand, there's something to be said for the doctrine. Overall, it would probably further the prohibition on delegation because many laws that would violate the non-delegation doctrine will be cut back under the major questions doctrine. But the major questions doctrine does not do a great job of enforcing the non-delegation doctrine because the major questions doctrine does not require a showing that the statute would be an unconstitutional delegation of authority if the statute were interpreted to have its actual meaning. Instead, the major question doctrine simply asks whether the statute involves significant economic or political authority, which is not the standard under any of the leading interpretations of the strict non-delegation doctrine. Thus, the major questions doctrine might cut back on statutory delegations that would not violate the non-delegation doctrine. For example, if a statute were in an area where the non-delegation doctrine, the strict non-delegation doctrine did not apply, such as foreign affairs, it would still presumably be subject to the major questions doctrine. While the major question doctrine does have benefits, it also has serious blemishes. Most importantly, the major questions doctrine is not consistent with originalist statutory interpretation, sometimes known as textualism, but that's another mistake out there, but okay. Um, a clear statement for significant delegations of authority, putting a finger on the scale in the way the a major questions doctrine does, does not capture the actual meaning of a statute. Um, this aspect of the major questions doctrine is unfortunate because there are various interpretive rules that would cut back on delegations and that are consistent with statutory originalism. Overall, they would produce most of the benefits of the major questions doctrine without having to impose non-originalist doctrine. And here I just, before, as part of concluding, I'll mention four interpretive rules that we could use instead of the major questions doctrine. First, and most importantly, one should not find significant delegations of authority with a weak textual basis. This is sometimes known as the no elephants in mouse holes canon, and it's entirely correct. But it's not the same thing as the major questions doctrine because a less than clear statement would often justify significant authority under an actual meaning analysis. Second, one should disfavor interpreting old, older statutes to address new matters that were not issues when the statutes were enacted. For example, one should disfavor interpreting the Clean Air Act's reference to old style pollutants like smog as referring to greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide. It's a traditional and legitimate canon that requires a court to look to the context of the statute and the mischief that the legislature was addressing. Third, the court should overturn or severely cut back on Chevron deference. Overturning Chevron would be consistent with originalism 
uh, as I've argued, that the original meaning of the Administrative Procedure Act did not adopt Chevron deference. Um, in an article, reprints are available. Um, finally, the court should apply a doctrine that, that would give weight to interpretations that were reached near the time of a law's enactment. This was a traditional interpretive principle that promotes the original meaning. Well, I could say a lot more, but let me stop here and uh, give Professor Stoner a chance, and then um, uh, I'll be back. Well, thank you to uh, Professor Lindquist and uh, Carol McNamara and the Center for Constitutional Design, to the Federal Society and its officers, uh, uh, to Professor Rappaport, uh, uh, expert on this topic uh, on which I'm a bit of a novice. I'm also a political scientist, I better confess. So uh, um, bear with me <laughs> for a moment and then uh, uh, save your slings and arrows for the uh, uh, question period where I welcome them. Can the legislative power be delegated? No, of course not. According to American constitutional principles, the legislative power has been delegated by the people to Congress, and it's an old maxim of law that potesta delegata non potest delegare. Uh, that is, uh, in case your Latin is as rusty as mine or my pronunciation was as weak as it probably was, a delegated power cannot be delegated. Or if you want to translate that into modern American English, if you borrow your parents' car, don't lend it to a friend. <laughs> Since that maxim, the first maxim, was in Latin originally, you can suppose that it can be traced back to Roman law, uh, where it figured in private law, as in the example of the car, uh, or I guess chariot, uh, but uh, apparently it was also applied in a judicial setting since a praetor could delegate some of his cases to his clerk, but the clerk could not delegate further to an assistant. But wait, what makes that maxim about not delegating the legislative power itself to be law? That, I think, is where we have to begin if we want to understand why the question of delegating the legislative power to the administrative state has become so controversial in modern America, and if we want to try to sort out what can be done about it. Why, then, are maxims like the one against delegated, dele uh, delegating delegated power or others, such as no one ought to profit from his own wrongs or no one ought to be judged in his own case, why are these themselves law? Well, they're thought to be basic maxims of justice, and thus they've long been incorporated into common law, the unwritten law originally inherited by the American colonists from England, the customary law that governs property, exchange, injuries, human relationships, and once even basic criminal matters. Uh, and is law as these disputes have been settled in courts of law, courts that themselves follow due process, which is defined by common law, including its characteristic mode of trial by jury. Common law was expounded and developed by following another maxim of justice, that similar cases ought to be similarly decided, and therefore judges at common law follow precedents, inferring a rule from the decision in an earlier case and then applying it in the next one that's similar. A similar case is, of course, not identical, uh, and since that's so, there's often an element of reasoning by analogy as the common law judge moves from case to case. Indeed, in hard cases, the issue is often which precedent to follow, that is, which analogy to draw. Modern cynics say that common law is judge-made law, but traditional common law, law judges thought they were finding law, the appropriate precedent, the most reasonable analogy, not making law. Legal historians might trace the original announcement of a rule of common law, but that doesn't mean they found its origin. To the common lawyer, the law unfolds according to reason and develops into what one 17th century authority called an artificial perfection of reason. Now, common law can be changed by statute. In fact, it's a maxim of common law. See how this works? It's a maxim of common law that a statute can override a contrary rule of common law. Though the first task of the judge in interpreting a statute is to determine whether it declares what was already common law or remedies some mischief that arose in it. 
in a common law environment then, the legislative power is first and foremost the power to declare or to change the law. Originally, the American colonists inherited from England not only the common law, but an unwritten political constitution. At the revolution, they put their new constitutions in writing, but they reaffirmed by declaratory statutes the common law, at least so much of it as was consistent with their new world circumstances and unchanged by their statutes. And these constitutions often declared in writing some of the basic practices of common law, particularly those associated with due process. In these constitutions, and especially or explicitly in the federal constitution drafted in 1787, the legislative power was said to be delegated by the people um, to the state assembly, in the case of the states, or to Congress, as the, origin, as the origin of political power was the consent of the governed. Consent being presumed in customary law, but inferred through representation in law that's newly made. The people delegating legislative power, investing it in uh, representative bodies, that power could not be further delegated without violation of that maxim with which I began. Indeed, as Columbia law professor Philip Hamburger has argued, uh, and as uh, Professor Rappaport uh, himself said, the vesting clauses that begin the first three articles of the federal constitution anchor the separate powers, legislative, executive, and judicial. And I think um, that uh, Hamburger is probably correct to say that this means unless specially provided for in a checking uh, mechanism, for example, the veto or um, the impeachment power, uh, unless spe specially established as a check, each brand was in intended to exercise only the kind of power vested in it. But here's the catch. In the exercise of authority, at least any rational exercise of authority, one cannot help making rules, if only implicitly, since the reason something is done suggests a rule for the future in similar matters. And it might be ac merely accidental whether one proceeds to formulate a rule. The accident being the how frequently the officer encounters the same situation. In simple times or uh, in rare and extraordinary events, for example, in going to war, the government's choice is an exercise of prudence, a particular judgment concerning a unique and unusual set of circumstances. But if similar circumstances are faced again and again, acting justly might seem to require the development of rules. Take the instance of a tax assessor. Not always the most popular people. The legislature might pass a tax on real property that's prorated according to the value of the property. But uh, and in a community of a few farms and estates, a judgment could be made about the value of each property. Uh, for after all, each would probably sell at its own price. But if one is considering row houses in a city or single family homes in a suburban development, it seems likely, if not strictly necessary, that the assessor would develop certain rules, factoring in, for example, the number of rooms or the square footage or the size of the lot and so forth. Or take the simple example of grading papers. In a seminar, the experienced professor can confidently judge the quality of each. But in a larger class, one might rely on a grading rubric or even assign exercises like multiple choice questions rather than essays uh, so that the grading can proceed by a rule. And now so that he can be sure or she can be sure it wasn't written by a computer. In a small setting, uh, one uh, wouldn't doubt that the assessor or the teacher is a sort of executive official. But uh, insensibly, as the stock of property or the size of, government, of schools grow, rules will emerge. When was legislative power delegated according to this path of development? Of course it wasn't. In the early cases concerning administration uh, 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 or non-legislative rulemaking, the U.S. Supreme Court recognized this process and didn't consider it to be delegation, or at least not unconstitutional delegation. I think they meant delegation as recognition of the legislative power. In the 1825 case that Professor Rappaport mentioned, Wayman v. Southard, uh, Chief Justice Marshall recognizes that, con that Congress established in the original Judiciary Act a general rule for federal procedure, 
the federal courts in each state were to follow the legal practice in that state as it existed in 1789, with the understanding, however, that judges could adjust practice in their court as they find necessary, but not that changes by the state legislatures and their own processes would be incorporated into federal law as if Congress had delegated the legislative power to the states. In the 1928 case of Hampton v. U.S., Chief Justice Taft stated that a congressional statute that allowed the president to adjust tariff rates within a set range uh, if he found it necessary to equalize commercial advantage for American firms being undersold by foreign competitors uh, or on the grounds that the tariff uh, uh, I'm sorry, he upheld this on the grounds that the tariff law established an intelligible principle and the executive or administrative rules only added a finding of fact and the sort of fact that varied too much in its particularities to be covered by a general rule of law. These decisions seem correct to me and the rule making they countenance seems legitimate and non-legislative. On the one hand, based on rules the judiciary um, would develop about their own courtrooms. On the other, based on changeable facts that an official in the midst of a market could ascertain well enough, but not necessarily a legislature like Congress. But the court also, I think, was correct in cases like Panama refining and Schechter poultry in 1935 to strike down the wholesale grant of regulating uh, entire industries without clear, clear principles, defining at least the outer limit of delegation. The modern cases seem much less clearly established as the court has developed a tangled jurisprudence that generally defers to agency rulemaking through recondite forms of deference, Chevron deference, uh, uh, our deference. Uh, I think the one concerns the uh, interpretation of their own statute of their of the statutes they're based on, the agency's based on the other, the agency's interpretations of its own. Uh, regulations, and then various forms of scrutiny, uh, as for example, this emerging major question doctrine. Although in principle, constitutional rights are supposedly protected in court against contrary administrative action, the proliferation of claims of rights seems to mean that even long established rights in common law, such as right to educate one's own children as one thinks best, or the rights of property, of course, and the, and the rights of bodily integrity, often get swept aside when faced with regulations of, say, education or uh, health bureaucracies. It's easy enough to understand why in areas of policy as diverse as immigration, environment, and health, people across the political spectrum, or maybe I should say uh, people of each party when government is in the hands of their opponents, uh, sense that governance is increasingly in the hands of the administrative state rather than subject to law made by the people's representatives. What's to be done? Well, first, I think the courts need to be vigilant in their protection of rights, constitutional, common law, and statutory, and not presume that a generally expressed good in a statute authorizing an agency and sketching its purpose uh, overrules or was meant to overrule claims of rights. And here I think if it's not against federal society rules, I'll say I'm in agreement <laughs> with uh, Professor Rappaport. Second, I think the proper administrative role involves finding facts, not making policy. And there again, I think we're in agreement. Uh, and that fact fighting should recover a sense of the distinction uh, between settled expertise and emergent science. Anyone with common sense can see that the excesses can, can see the excesses perpetrated in the uh, past few years in the name of following the science. And any genuine scientist will concede the provisional character of most scientific uh, discoveries, at least at the moment that they first appear. Not to mention acknowledge the multiplicity of sciences. Practical thinking, I think, uh, has to weigh scientific claims where evidence is disputable and the judgment of which uh, experts to consult when is profoundly practical or prudential, not settled easily by bureaucratic structures or uh, by uh, uh, some kind of algorithm or for that matter, even by legislation. Third, arbitrary and capricious review under the terms of the Administrative Procedure Act seems to me in need of being tightened. Uh, whatever merits uh, are of the unitary presidency and their good reasons, originalist and consequentialist in its favor, still the obviously partisan character of what is sometimes touted as expertise ought to be recognizable and suspect. 
More generally, what is needed is confinement of agencies to their statutory purposes, not permitting regulations uh, that are wholly an ancillary to their main charge, something like the old doctrine of ultra vires, uh, of going outside of one's bounds. The stretching of sensible statutes to implement partisan policy objectives certainly seems to me to be objectionable. Do emergencies allow actions outside the beaten path? Well, of course, but routine declarations of emergency are a contradiction in terms, and those need to be uh, quashed. Finally, if the legislative power has indeed been delegated, the principal solution has to be for the legislature itself to recover it. And here might be where we're going to be at, uh, at some odds. Actually, that's almost the nature of legislative power, for it is, in terms of the history of political theory, the youngest power, courts having existed all through time, the executive only, uh, by name, only since the Renaissance, and the legislative power as such, only since the English Civil War and the theory of John Locke. Both in Locke's account and in that common law definition that I suggested at the outset, legislation involves the correction of abuses or mischiefs that were not adequately addressed under the existing state of affairs. The administrative state was created to address real social problems, or agency by agency, it was created for that reason, but where it itself has become a greater problem than that which it was created to address, Congress has in its power, if not necessarily in its political will and capacity, to alter or abolish its creature and to introduce new forms. Thank you. Uh, let's have brief rejoinders, maybe four minutes. Yeah, um, yeah no, I, I, I think I can live with that. I, I think I'll, I'll sit here. Um, let, let me try to sort of um, uh, step back from this and see where uh, Professor Stone and I agree and where maybe we disagree. So um, we, we actually are, are pretty much on the same side of this issue. Um, where, so, so um, maybe this should be more like an American Constitution Society event where both the speakers agree. Um, uh, um, uh, so, so we're both, you know, very skeptical of, of um, delegation and, and think it's problematic under the Constitution. So um, if one had somebody with a, with a different view, they, they'd be out here saying, oh, delegation is okay, it's needed for the, for the modern administrative state, and we couldn't live without it, or something like that. And in fact, you know, er, early examples of delegation exist, and so it's, it's consistent with the original meaning. So, so that, that would be that position. Uh, Professor Stoner and I, um, for the most part, disagree with that. So, um, so where do we, we disagree? Um, well, uh, I, I guess I would break it up into two different questions. So, so the first one that I looked at was, does the non-delegation doctrine apply across the board to all different areas? And I conclude that, that it doesn't apply across the board. Why? Not because I necessarily think that delegation would be a great thing in this, these uh, um, certain areas, but because historically there was a lot of delegation in certain areas. And um, given that, uh, it's, it's hard, I think, to argue under the original meaning that delegation was prohibited in those areas. Um, so just to take one example, the Northwest Ordinance, which was passed at the time of the Constitution, ended up allowing uh, the territories to make their own legislative decisions. Congress didn't make those decisions, the territories made those decisions. That's pretty clearly a delegation to the, to the territorial legislatures to decide on things, right? So it's pretty hard, I think, to argue that uh, non-delegation happens across the board when you have an example like that. And I could give you other examples from, from Indian affairs, spending rules, um, and, and I, I'll, I'll just, uh, Leave it at that, given the, the shortness of time. Um, so that's one area where we're, I think, in some disagreement. On the other hand, I think in the strict tier, where we are in agreement. Now, what should happen in the strict tier where the non-delegation doctrine fully applies? Um, 
The, the test that I've given is um, a, an attempt to kind of be consistent with the historical materials, but also not have a kind of vague test that says, well, the legislature's got to decide the important things, like, well, well what's an important thing? Um, and instead say, okay, the, the, the executive gets to make facts, fact finding, um, and gets to interpret statutes, but other than that, can't, can't do things. Um, can't be delegated, it's gotta be from, from the Congress. Um, and I wasn't quite sure where Professor Stoner stood on, on that, as some of what he said seemed to um, adopt the, the, the Marshall view, some other things maybe not, so, so maybe we can, we, we can focus in on that a little bit. So, but that's sort of a stepping back where we're at here, How, what parts we agree on, what parts we maybe disagree on. Okay, so I, I, think I think that, that um, first of all, uh, I agree, I think, on what you just said about where we agree and where we disagree. So, uh, uh, but they came for a fight, so let's see if we can, uh, we, we can, well, right, I mean, right, so, so, uh, so let's see if we can find something uh, uh, that's real. Well, here's the first thing. I don't think that, I don't think it's, it would be correct to say that, there was delegation of the legislative power uh, allowed from the beginning, even in some circumstances. Uh, the, the best example you have, I think, is the one concerning the territories. But that was a hot issue. And of course, that becomes the issue in Dred Scott, right? Was there, was, uh, had there been and could there have been a full delegation? And I think it was understood to be only a limited sort of delegation uh, uh, that was involved, or at least rulemaking for the provisional and sort of unique circumstances uh, of a beginning um, of a beginning time, that the legislative power remained in uh, in Congress. Uh, now I have to go look at that, and so uh, we check on that. Uh, but I think. That Hamburger says this, and I think he's right on this, that there's no delegation of the legislative power. All there is is a recognition that rulemaking happens and that it happens, as it were, naturally in applying law. And so the distinction he would draw, and I think he's right here, is the distinction between law and administrative rules. And it's, of course, always going to be the case that administrative rules happen if you uh, run any department if you've ever had an assistant, right? Uh, do things this way <laughs> becomes a kind of rule, but um, but you certainly wouldn't have to go back to a law <laughs> to uh, put everything in the job description, right? Uh, but the second point I think has to do with the problem in that phrase policy making, which I think is the one you want to use to distinguish when to allow delegation and when not to. Uh, the term policy making is, if I'm not mistaken, a term that develops in the 20th century, uh, especially through political scientists who are redefining law as policy making. And that it happens only after the kind of, I won't call it exactly collapse, but the sequestration of the common law. And, uh, and where law now is interpreted as an instrument of policy rather than as uh, the community's authoritative uh, sense of what is right and wrong, and uh, where uh, even coercion could be used to vindicate right and to um, uh, punish wrong. So I, I think on those two points, now they might just be semantic, but I think if we, if we thought it out, we'll actually find there are real differences that come if we uh, if we take those different views, I'm just going to take a quick sure response. I'm going to step up here so I can see the students. Yeah. Um, so um, first of all, I, I don't think uh, that those are helpful remarks and sort of focusing in on our where we agree and disagree. Let me just say quick rejoinders here. The territories is not the only example, and I, I, I don't agree with uh, Press Stoner's take that it was a limited power. Um, if you, anyone's really interested in this, there, there's an article by Bagley and Mortensen, which goes on for 100 pages with example after example. Now, your, your own professor, Elon Worman, has a response and cuts back on, on, on some of this, but, but I don't think um, you, you can say that, that there wasn't significant delegation in certain areas at the frame. So, so that's, that's one area where we disagree. Um, another point, um, 
I think Professor Stoner sees delegation as being about giving to the, the executive the power to announce rules. Um, but actually, um, even if you give to the executive the power not to announce a rule, but just to take an action, if that action is not limited by the statute, that's a delegation. Um, in fact, it's worse, right? When the, when, the, when the executive takes an action and could decide in one case one thing and in another case a, a different thing, um, that's, that's even worse of a delegation, as, as we certainly saw under COVID. Um, finally, um, so, so, so I, well, I'll just leave it at that point at that. Uh, thirdly, the policy-making point, Professor Stoner says, well, that was developed um, later on by, by political scientists. And, and as a concept or as a term, I, I think that, that may very well be right. But if you go back and you look at the, the debates at the time of the framing early on, um, it's pretty clear that, that what they're referring to is policy-making, even though they don't use that term. They're talking about um, who's making the decisions as to... Uh, whether actions are permitted or not permitted. So I think they have policy making in mind, even though they're not actually using the term policy making. And with that, uh, thank you for, for excellent remarks and, uh, uh, and the back and forth. Um, and Professor Rappaport just mentioned uh, one of ASU Law School's treasures, uh, Ilan Mormon. Those of you who have not taken his administrative law class, I encourage you to do so. Um, the words fun and administrative law usually are not conjoined, uh, but in his case, they often are. He's wrong about the privileges or immunities clause. <laughs> But, uh, but I love uh, a lot of his views on administrative law. Have at it. Um, we've got uh, till 1.15, is that right? So who's, who's up first? Is that you think the Constitution treats delegations differently depending on who's being delegated to the power? Do you think there could be differences, depending on whether it's the president or an independent agency or even a private trade group or something? Interesting point. Well, traditionally, um, I, I mean, I, I, I certainly do. So, so traditionally, in terms of the of the law, delegations to private entities have been thought to be problematic, more problematic, and the court has been pretty um, uh, diligent about prohibiting those or at least um, attempting to do so. Now, where would that come from? Um, in in my view, when you delegate to the executive, the executive can say, well, I'm just exercising executive power here. And then we have a fight about whether it's executive power or legislative power. But, but um, the, the executive can claim to be exercising executive power. By contrast, when you give to a private person uh, a delegation, they can't say, oh, it's OK for me to be doing this because I'm exercising executive power. No, the executive power is in the executive, not in a private party. So I think that, that that is a strong reason for, for thinking that delegations to private parties are more problematic. Now, independent agencies, um, I, I understand why one might think that, that they're more problematic. Uh, I think independent agencies are unconstitutional to begin with, but assuming you have them and assuming they exercise executive power, um, it, it's hard to draw a distinction. That was a provocative statement that perhaps someone may want to follow up on. But um, Professor Stoner, I think, thoughts on that question? Yeah, I guess the, again, I'm not willing to say their legislative power is ever delegated, right? I mean, their delegated can be fact finding. That is, uh, and I think this is what you were aiming for, right? I mean, fact, at least in some cases, right? Fact fighting that can have legal effect. Uh, so I, the only example in this room that can come to my mind of delegating to a private agency is uh, to the bar associations, right? Because they, they eff effectively, I mean, they, they determine whether you're qualified to serve as, a, as, a, uh, as, as an attorney and, and, and therefore represent another person in, in, uh, in courts. And so that's a kind of delegation to a private agency, but presumably they're finding the fact of your qualification to represent another person. And you could think of a matter where you might, uh, I guess you could have a building code and so you wanna make sure the plumbers are good plumbers, but 
why would the state legislature know that except by uh, um, you know, some ha having a plumber on staff or something like that. So, so, so that's, uh, but you can see why it's done, right? I mean, and, 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 and why it could be necessary in order to ensure, I mean, if, if, a, if a legislative body can pass a building code, then uh, you might need to get this information somewhere. And so just speaking abstractly about delegating, I, I don't, it's not the legislative power that's delegated. What's delegated is the determination of the, uh, of the qualification of the individuals involved. Am I, am I wrong on that? It, it, it just doesn't work that way. One of the things that the ABA does, for example, is, is look at law schools mm -hmm. and, and say, oh, are you accredited as a law school? Well, they, they make all kinds of policy determinations. So sometimes they'll go to a law school and say, oh, you don't have enough affirmative action going on here. You don't have enough diversity. Um, that's not a fact-finding question. That's a, that's a policy de de determination as to how much uh, affirmative action you want and, uh, and how much you, you don't want. They, they, they do that. Right, but of course, that's that's a question of whether or not the, 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 uh, the, the states have been... Uh, have been correct or have limited in the proper way this uh, recognition of what constitutes uh, excellence or, or uh, uh, in the study of law or in the study of in, in providing university degrees and the like. And so, as I say, the legislative power is something that in a way is always having to be recovered, <laughs> right? You're going to add a rule because the current system is problematic. And so, I'm not sure you could say abstractly it's wrong to uh, to to, to expect that the a the ABA would accredit law schools, but if what's happened is that ABA has become a politicized body where it's accrediting by trying to uh, in, on the basis of whether certain policies that are politically uh, um, uh, disputable are enforced, then it seems to me the state legislature has to recover that. <laughs> and say either we're going to have to set up our own accreditation, some genuinely bipartisan accreditation agency, or we'll go without accreditation or some other sort of scheme for determining it. Other questions? Yeah. I have a question um, about sort of discretion. I think the issue here is how much can we squeeze discretion out of the city that we it's always difficult to squeeze discretion out of governmental decision making, no matter how you set it up, right? <clears throat> I describe it as mercury to my students. It's just, it's slippery. It's, it ends up with sort of bodily integrity, no matter where you push it. And um, and so I have a question about the, Amer the Administrative Procedure Act and how you deal with or address an issue I think Professor Stoner raised, which is in adjudication, right? The Administrative Procedure Act gives alternatives to agencies. They can either adjudicate and bring and enforce the statute via adjudication, and thus develop rules and regulations, so to speak, through precedence, or they can do it by rule. And Professor Rappaport said at the end of his, I think the last one of the last comments, that he preferred to see rules, and I would too, because they're more generalizable. But how do you deal with, I mean, ultimately, if you want to, you know, if you want to create very strict delegation, then you are going to push agencies into the adjudication. And in the adjudication, they or they are going to make, they are going to have discretion in applying and enforcing the statute. I agree entirely. I mean, I, I think that's my point, right? That uh, there's always going to be discretion there. And so the question is, how do you how do you deal with discretion? Those are two different ways of dealing with it. Uh, uh, but they're both meant in a way to address the same thing. And presumably you you go with an adjudicatory adjudicatory model when you've got lots of different circumstances and things don't easily follow under rules. And if you've got something that's 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 pretty regular and common, the suburban houses, right, as opposed to the uh, the separate estates uh, uh, and my old property analogy, then you you choose to go with a rule if a rule would work. But but that's that itself is something where choices are going to have to be made, although you're going to be able to look at that. Right. And say, wait, <laughs> at this point, <laughs> the adjudication is 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 uh, is sort of out of whack and uh, uh, it's it's all favoritism, and we need some rules. 
Uh, but that's for Congress, it seems to me, for Congress to recover. In other words, I think that part of what we have here is that the administrative state and this delegation, as it's happened, has become a kind of excuse for Congress not to take responsibility uh, for acting. We want things done and then we can't agree how to do them. And we don't have to agree about every detail about how to do them or else Congress would just be a body giving orders and that's not what law is. But on the other hand, it's, it seems to me those, we have to recover those and be grown ups about deciding what it is we want government to do. If government can't do something well, it shouldn't do it. Right. Good luck with that. I'd like to respond, respond to that. So it is, I think a premise of the question there was that delegation only happens when you give to an agency the power to enact a rule, because then it seems like it's being legislated. But that's. No, 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 I did not. Okay, so, well, okay. The power then, to enforce carries with it the power to create rules through precedent. That was important. So. And that's well, what, what I thought what you said was that, well, if we apply delegation to, to agencies, then they're going to end up not adopting rules, but they'll end up adopting, um, they'll end up adopting particular actions, and that will be even more problematic. And I, I guess what I want to say is I, I don't think that, that occurs, at least under my way of looking at things. To me, the question is not whether or not an agency has a rulemaking authority or takes particular actions. The question is, is there discretion given to the agency to enact policy? So for example, if you have a statute that says the agency gets to do something when it believes it's in the public interest, that's problematic if the agency acts on an ad hoc basis, once at a time, never adopts a rule, or that's problematic if they adopt the rule that says, oh, well, our view of the public interest is this and we're gonna follow this rule. Both of those are problematic because they give too much discretion to, to the agency. So I don't think a non-delegation uh, rule will lead to less rules. It'll just lead to less discretion on the part of the agency. All right, one last short question with short answers, if anyone. <laughs> With that, that shortens the time before we get to have lunch. So thank you very much. You always make me proud and you did again today. And thank you to the speakers. Thank you for listening to Necessary and Proper. If you enjoyed this podcast, please tell a friend and don't forget to subscribe on iTunes or Google Play. To learn more about the Article 1 initiative, please visit fedsoc.org slash article I. That's F-E-D-S-O-C dot org slash article I. This has been a FedSoc audio production.